We all know the real world isn't black and white, and the weather is no different. It too is comprised of many colours. The weather forecasts may contain many possibilities, but most of the time, us forecasters try to provide just one most likely result. But why should a forecast try to determine a single black or white outcome rather than present a more well-rounded picture of the potential weather to come? At the Met Office, we are always looking at better ways to communicate our weather forecasts, and this is just one reason why we are using a different technique called ensembles. And that is what we are exploring in this video. Now, if you're a regular viewer to our deep dives or 10-day trends, you'll already know a bit about them. And in this video, we're going to explore the why. Why do we use ensemble forecasts and why do we need them? And to answer that, well, we first actually need to answer a tricky question. Why can't we make 100% accurate forecasts 100% of the time? And for this, we need to bring some chaos to the party. Chaos theory isn't new. You may be aware of it, or at least have heard something about the butterfly effect. So what is it about these insects messing with our weather predictions? When we make a weather forecast, we are trying to predict what our atmosphere will be like at a certain time ahead in the future. It, it could be six hours, a day, four days, or a week. Now, in order to make any kind of future prediction about any subject, you need to know what the situation is right now. Who's going to win the league this year? You'd want to know what the league table looked like. What will interest rates be in two months' time? You'd want knowledge of the current economic landscape. So, for our weather forecasts, we measure the weather from top to bottom, side to side, throughout the atmosphere, sending balloons up, looking down with satellites, scanning across with radar, using thermometers on land, in the sea and in the ground, and many, many other ways. But even then, we can't know absolutely everything. We don't measure the exact temperature at every point in the sky. And going even smaller, we can't possibly know the position of each individual molecule in the atmosphere. Does that matter? Well, it turns out that yes, it does. Time for a demonstration. Let's use this Galton board. If I drop balls in at the top, well, they find their way to the bottom and end up in different slots. Now, if everything was exactly the same, each time I dropped a ball in here, the end results, where the ball ends up, would be exactly the same, right? After all, the balls aren't choosing where to go, it's just physics. The balls are bouncing around, kind of like the molecules in our atmosphere do. But then, you would be amazed if I dropped 10 balls in here, one after another, and they all ended up in the same end slot at the bottom. The key thing here is, of course, that everything isn't exactly the same. I can't be 100% sure I'm letting go in exactly the same place each time. One ball may be a tiny bit heavier than the next, or even a tiny bit more grease from my fingers. The temperature in the room could have changed a tiny fraction, or the pressure. The point is, the tiniest of changes in the starting conditions makes a big difference to the end result. The weather depends on many things, many of which we know an awful lot about, but some of which we can't possibly know. This is where the butterfly comes in. Every time a butterfly flutters or a seagull flaps its wings, or indeed every time you and I go outside, we are moving or altering the atmosphere simply by interacting with it in a tiny, tiny way. Now, of course, most of these tiny differences make no difference whatsoever to the weather, but it only takes a few of them to grow. Once a tiny difference changes the wind a little bit, that moves the air around slightly differently, changes the patterns of temperature and pressure ever so slightly, but that then changes the wind a little bit more, which moves the air around differently, altering the pressure a little bit more. You can see that very quickly, what started off as a tiny difference can suddenly start developing into a bigger difference. And over a number of hours, or particularly days, we can get quite different forecasts. 
That's what's happening here. These are two weather forecasts showing where rain is expected. The two forecasts look identical initially, but with tiny differences at the start that lead then to differences much greater in a few days' time and even bigger changes in five days' time. So the tiny differences, just like in the ball dropping game, can change the end result. This is chaos theory. Very small changes in the starting conditions can make a big difference to the outcome. So you can never know exactly what the weather's going to be because there are so many things you just don't know about the starting conditions. Look, we take in millions and millions of bits of weather information to draw up what the weather is doing at the start of each forecast. And the more information, the better the idea of the starting conditions and the more accurate the forecast. So we can keep getting better, but we simply can't know everything. We can't know when Mr. Smith is popping to the shops that morning or when each butterfly or seagull will flap its wings. OK, so that's why we can't ever get the weather 100% accurate 100% of the time. And that is why we need to look at predicting and communicating the weather in different ways. Different ways that can be useful for different people in different situations. That is why we use ensembles. But what are they? Well, we'll be looking at that in the next part. In this video, we'll be answering the question, what are ensembles? How are they different from other weather forecasts? Now, the way forecasts have been done for years is you get as much information about the current weather situation as possible. You plug that into a computer model and based on the laws of physics, it gives you a prediction of the future atmosphere. This is called a deterministic forecast. Let's break it down using a diagram. So say this is the starting point, the weather right now. And the end result, the forecast is over here, the weather in a few days time. Time is going along the bottom here. Now, before you even start, you do have some idea of what the end result will be. For example, let's say it's November and you're looking at the maximum temperature in Edinburgh in five days time. Now, you can be pretty sure it's not going to be 25 Celsius because 25 Celsius has never been recorded in Edinburgh in November. And you know it's not going to be minus 25 Celsius for the same reason. So there are a range of results that are realistic and based on records of what we know about the climate of Edinburgh measured over many decades. We have this range. Now, the ideal would be to run the forecast in the computer model and get to the exact point in five days time and for that to be right 100% of the time. But as we discussed in the last part, that simply isn't going to happen. This is where an ensemble forecast comes in. What an ensemble forecast is, is running the computer not just once like in the deterministic, but many times. And that gives you a range of different forecasts, kind of like a multiverse of different possibilities. How do we do this? Well, remember, we can't know absolutely everything about the starting conditions because of chaos and those pesky butterflies. With an ensemble forecast, what we do is we shake the starting conditions up just a little bit, tweak a temperature here, change the humidity there, nudge the pressure a little bit. And from lots of different starting conditions, we then get the different forecasts at the end time. So now you have lots of different end results. Is that useful? Well, it can be because you can turn that range of different answers or spread as it's known into a probability or the chance of something happening. This is what an ensemble looks like. They're called postage stamps because of how they look like those sheets of stamps you used to get at post offices. Each one, each stamp is called a different member and each one is 
a different line on that diagram we just saw, a different forecast. Each one is a result of that little shake-up we gave those initial weather conditions. Each one is a different possible future atmosphere in that multiverse. Now let's go back to the example, the temperature in Edinburgh. If you have 100 members, that's 100 different possible future atmospheres, you have 100 answers to the question, what will the maximum temperature be in Edinburgh in five days' time? Now, let's say that 40 of them are saying between 10 and 12 Celsius. You can now state that the chance of the maximum temperature in Edinburgh in five days' time being between 10 and 12 Celsius is 40 in 100, which is 40%. So you can turn that multiverse of different possible futures into a number. But is that useful? having a percentage chance of something happening. We know there's some confusion about probabilities in weather forecasting. But as we'll see in the next part, the answer again is very much yes. It can be very, very useful. Do you remember the beast from the east in 2018? For such a rare event, the snow was pretty well forecast and the potential for severe weather was flagged several days in advance, giving first responders, planners and the public plenty of notice. A large part of the reason for that was ensemble forecasts. Ensembles are very useful in identifying areas where severe weather is possible. And in this part, we'll be looking at how ensemble forecasts can be used. Now, these are the actual ensemble forecasts from the beast from the east, the members of the multiverse we talked about in the last part. Here's the UK with a, a white outline and all the colours are precipitation. Now, in this case, the air was so cold that pretty much everything falling out of the sky, all the precipitation was snow. What are they showing us? Well, they're actually all showing us that we're going to get an easterly wind. All the precipitation, all the bright colours are coming in from the east. So we know that there's going to be an easterly wind. We can be very confident of that. But as you'll know, actually the beast from the east wasn't just about where the wind was coming from, it was much more about heavy snowfall. Now each of the members is also showing us that we are going to see snow showers on the east coast across eastern Scotland and eastern England. The, the snow showers are coming in in every member. So again, we can be pretty confident that we are going to see heavy snow showers across those eastern areas. But in the south, there are some pretty big differences. Let's take a closer look at a couple of members for the same time frame, when the beast from the east actually hit. This one is showing it's dry in the south. No precipitation across South Wales or southwest England. But this one, again, same time frame, but a different member, is showing the potential for snow across the south. Very different outcomes. If we were to go back to the black and white world of deterministic forecasting, where we only have one forecast, if this had been the deterministic forecast, we wouldn't have seen the potential for heavy snow. We wouldn't have seen snow in the south even as a possibility. So by using ensembles, by using this method, we can see that there is a chance of heavy snow. But thanks to ensembles, we can actually put a number on that chance of something like this happening. Let's take a look at these maps now. They're made using ensembles, the multiverse approach. They're not showing where snow will be light or heavy, but rather the chance of getting five centimetres of snow based on all the members, all of the different stamps. So if 75 of the 100 members are generating those five centimetres of snow at a location, that would be mapped on here as a 75% a chance. Or if five of the 100 members are generating five centimetres of snow, that would be mapped as 5%. So here we have, from six days ahead, the first signal of the risk of snow in the south. As we got closer to the time, you can see how we go from a bigger area of yellows showing a small chance 
to a much more focused area with a higher chance, the darker colours. This is just not possible using a deterministic or, or single model. By using the ensemble process, that allowed us to give advanced warning of the possibility of this very high impact snow five or six days ahead. This meant preparations could be made well ahead of time. Closer to the time, as the chances of heavy snow increased, we were able to fine tune the warnings. Yellow warnings were upgraded to amber and ultimately red. As a result of the ensemble approach, we were able to get the message out to specific areas, allowing resources to be moved around and the public to make alternate plans. So what about the future? How will ensembles help you? Okay, let's now take three examples. First up, say you're planning a big event, maybe a party outside, perhaps it's even your wedding day. Now, on your wedding day, knowing that there's a chance of a thunderstorm would be useful, right? Even if that chance of a thunderstorm were only, say, 20%, so there's an 80% chance of it staying dry. But it's such a big event, you probably want a backup plan, a contingency for if that storm did hit. Okay, example two. Now think it's the, it's the same weather scenario, but instead of a big event, you're just going for a walk in the country. Now that 20% chance of a storm probably doesn't alter your plans. You'd still risk it. You'd probably just make sure you have a waterproof. And the third scenario, you're at home, you're baking a cake, 20% chance of a storm doesn't affect your plans at all. Now let's flip the chances in the same scenario. So it's now an 80% chance of a torrential downpour and only a 20% chance of it staying dry. To the cake maker, it doesn't change anything. But to the rambler, maybe you'd rethink that walk. Look to take it later in the day or maybe postpone till tomorrow. And for the wedding planner, well, they can't reschedule. They need to double down on that contingency and make sure that everyone is aware of it. The point here is that everyone has their own appetite for risk and every situation is different. And here's the thing, we, the Met Office, can't know that appetite for risk. We don't know everyone's individual situation. We don't know why you want to know the weather that day. There's a million different reasons. And if we just give one outcome, say, yes, there will, or no, there won't be a thunderstorm over your house, then it's going to be wrong more often and actually much less useful. Now, it doesn't have to be weather as impactful as the beast from the east or a thunderstorm on a wedding day. Ensembles are really useful in helping people go about their everyday life from not choosing to wear their new suede jacket because there's a risk of it getting rained on or, or the classic putting the washing out to dry. Ensemble forecasts are not actually new. We've been using them for a while, but we now think that they are much better than the old deterministic way that we are going to use them for all our forecasting. Many forecasts will still look exactly the same, but we're also keen for as many people as possible to understand how using the extra information in ensemble forecasts can help you make better decisions to make the best of whatever the weather throws at us. Thanks for watching. Please like and share this, and we'll be making more videos on this theme in the coming months. So if you've got any questions or any feedback, let us know in the comments.